Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Let's continue to worship him together. Stand with me as we worship him in song. Two, three. Everything. 
Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. Wasn't it good to hear the choir again? Happy Palm. Yeah, let's give them another round of applause there. And a praise offering to the Lord too. It's great, so great to see so many of you that haven't been able to be in a while. And we're so glad that these vaccine shots now are opening things up and giving us more confidence to gather back together. Good to see Lamar and Debbie Mooneyham here among others. Love you guys so much and so thankful to see you here. And uh, if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here, whether it's your first time or you've been several times now. We're glad to have you in the house of the Lord with us to worship the Lord this Palm Sunday. And uh, in the back, there's a place where we give our offerings if we're physically here. And uh, if um, uh, that's also a place where you can, if you're a visitor, get a card and fill it out and put it in there and it'll record your attendance with us today. And we'll thank you for doing that. Of course, we appreciate those watching online being with us as well. Well, and you can send us a text or an email. Uh, we're glad that uh, we're all here uh, together uh, worshiping the Lord this morning. And we've been talking about how we are about to start a 50-day church love dare. And many of you have already grabbed the booklet that we're going to use, a 50-day church love dare for the Tabernacle of Danville. Uh, and if you're here physically with us today, you can get these uh, in both opportunity desks and the foyer out there. And so make sure you have one because it starts next Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, and we'll go for 50 days through Pentecost Sunday. And let me read the introduction uh, of it now. Let's face it, before the COVID-19 pandemic began in March of 2020, most American churches already felt how hard it is to get church members to model the kind of devotion to their churches that it looks like the brothers and sisters in Christ had in the early church. We Americans prize our options. We have come to treat church like life like going to a buffet table. We select what we want and reject what we don't want. Churches that now cater to what people want often can draw a big crowd on Sunday mornings. But what if church is about more than what we want? How will we respond if looking at the New Testament shows that our buffet table approach to church falls well short of what the Bible calls for? If the fastest growth in the human body is cancer, how can we define success for a church by looking only at the size of the crowd? I was once with some fellow church leaders in the area. In the course of the conversation, I commented on the high percentage of people in our area who volunteer in area churches. Several of the other leaders laughed, thinking I was joking. I had wrongly assumed that they had as high a percentage serving, people serving as the tabernacle does. Reflecting on that later, it made me so grateful to have so many members committed to ministering both inside and outside their church. But that was before the pandemic. Prognosticators predict that as churches get to the other side of this pandemic, churches will have at least 20% fewer attendees giving at least 20% less offerings and being far less likely to be involved in any kind of ministry. Uh, this isn't in here, but I think of Pastor Lamar always encouraging everyone here to find something around the church you can put your name on, right? Fewer are putting their name on things around the church uh, these days. I certainly hope that is not true here at the Tabernacle. With that in mind, I want to challenge the entire church family to commit to this 50-day church love there. Together, let's learn or relearn the main lessons God has us gather and then scatter. Here's how to make the most of these 50 days. 
Each household of the church should get a copy of this church love there on or before Easter Sunday, April 4th. Many of you have already done that. Check it off. If your household is just one person, ask, uh, ask other, another person or household to go through this book with you on the phone each day or to use something like Zoom. Have one person read the entry of the day, stopping when input is requested from the household. If the entry asks you to send input to the pastor or someone else, act on that the same day if at all possible, and then close each day with prayer. Beloved, I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you, Pastor Danny. I'm really looking forward to what the Lord's going to do during this time. Then I put this verse here where Jesus in Matthew 16, 18 said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so we're so thankful that in a real sense, we need to follow the Lord and we need to reproduce faithful and fruitful followers of Jesus Christ. But it's Jesus' job, he said, to build the church using those who are willing to be spiritual bricks, to be part of a living body who grow together and advance the cause of Christ on earth together. Now, if you're still online and you're not able to get here, we've even got people in other states and other countries that have been watching, you can go to the tabernaclefamily.org website and you can go to where it says sermons and then devotionals and under that you'll be able to access this love there and print it out or uh, save it so you can look over these days with it where you are too and so we're so thankful to be doing this together uh, it is a great time to be alive uh, God knew everything about how this last year would unfold. He knew everything about you and your household. And he knew that it was his plan to put us together, just like in Esther's day, where she had been raised up for such a time as this. All throughout this time, Christians have been leading the way in not having the same fear of death that others have. Christians have been leading the way in getting back out and amongst people and uh, serving and meeting needs. And all along the way, uh, we've been helping uh, uh, give uh, gifts that help uh, in the local schools feed children and meet very specific needs and those things. And so as things further open up, we're going to have all the more privilege. And it is going to be a, 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 a limited time only opportunity because everybody wants to get back to exactly what they were doing before all this started and so right now is the time as much as ever for the church to be the church and if we don't win some people for Jesus in these next couple months they will uh, harden their heart and not have another opportunity to hear perhaps for decades to come and so it is a great time to be alive and to be serving Christ and to be uh, praying for the lost reaching out to the lost and finding something you can put your name on in the church or at God's pit crew and being part of uh, advancing Christ's dear cause. Well, before I go to pray, prayer, I noticed that one of the choir members was Alan Howard, and I want you to pray for Alan and Ruby. Uh, yesterday morning, his dear mother Florence uh, did go to be with Jesus, and so we're praying uh, for Alan and his family at this time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your amazing love. And Jesus, we think about you on Palm Sunday riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, a beast of burden, a working animal, because there was work to do. You were going to the cross to die in our place, to deal with our sin problem, so that we could turn to you in faith and receive your salvation and forgiveness. We thank you for doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> doing the work so that we could experience salvation by faith. Salvation does have everything to do with work, but it's you who did the work, Jesus. And when we place our faith in you and the work you did for us on the cross, there's new birth in our lives. We thank you that one day you're going to return. You're going to be riding on the white horse. That's a show animal. And we thank you that because of what you've already done, your victory is guaranteed and you will return and you will set up an earthly kingdom that will not have any of the sin and sorrow earth has as it has now we thank you for that and we thank you for later the later reality of us all being in new bodies on a new earth forever and ever Lord Jesus we thank you for your gospel and we thank you for the body of Christ we thank you that when you save us you put us with other believers in a local body of Christ to grow together to encourage one another to admonish one another to grow together in Christ and to advance your gospel locally and globally Lord God to meet urgent needs in our own midst in our community and around the world 
God, we thank you for the privilege it is. Lord, this past year, it's been easy to take a... It, we, we've realized how complacent we've become in church too often and taking things for granted. And now as there's this ongoing opening back up, Lord God, we pray that we'd go forward as the body of Christ, go forward in faith together in very difficult days, but days full of opportunity. Lord, I do pray you'd be with those families still grieving a loss in the last few weeks, Lord God. And we lift up to you, Alan and Ruby Howard, and their family now, God. Thank you for how his dear mother, Florence, Lord, loved you and would witness there in the home she was in, God. And she was just uh, so encouraging to talk to, Lord. She loved you. She loved your word. And, Lord, I thank you for the great saints of the church like Florence Howard. Thank you for how Psalm 116 tells us that precious in your sight is the death of your saints because to be absent from the body, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, is to be present with the Lord. Meet us today as we worship you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord in song? Oh, 
the cross where I first saw the light and the burning of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. Sing it with us. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis Are you glad you came to church this morning? I sure am, or that the church came to you. Uh, Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And I believe we're going to put up a picture of a man here. And raise your hand if you know who that good looking fellow there is. Anybody out there know who that fellow is from your history class? All right. I don't see many hands going up. Might not see any hands going up. That is a fellow we all ought to know about. That is the Marquis de Lafayette. And the Marquis de Lafayette was a French nobleman who greatly inspired America during the Revolutionary War against Britain. Now, he was incredibly wealthy. Uh, as, an, as a young man, though, he disliked the la di da I think that's what he called it, the court of France, the la di da court life. And he longed to fight for liberty, to give his life for a cause. When he was just 19 years old, he used some of his wealth to buy a ship, and he sailed from France to join with the American patriots arriving in South Carolina in June of 1777. He declared this, The welfare of America is intimately connected with the happiness of all mankind. And so he volunteered to serve in the patriot army without pay. And General Washington said, Good, because that's all I can give you. I don't have any pay for you. But he fought bravely beside the Americans, and he suffered with them at Valley Forge despite being a child of privilege. He had given all that up to be suffering and identifying with the Americans uh, in their battle. George Washington became like a father to him, so much so that later on when he had a son, there was no other thing to name him except Washington. And so he did. And after the revolution, he sailed back to France and continued to do all the things that a nobleman would do back in France. But nearly 50 years later, as an older man, Lafayette returned to see his old comrades. And you can look it up. I mean, as he went to state after state, uh, city after city, they threw big parades for him. They made statues of him. They were so excited about this man. And even though so much time had elapsed, some of the ones he fought with were still able to come out. And at every city, there'd be a meet and greet afterwards, kind of, where he talked to his old comrades there. At one such reception, there was an old soldier in a faded uniform who approached the Frenchman. And over his shoulder, he carried a tattered blanket. I mean, the thing was in rags by this point. He drew himself up, uh, gave a salute to Lafayette, and asked if Lafayette remembered the snows of Valley Forge. And And the the Frenchman Frenchman said, I shall never forget them. Ooh, it was so cold, so cold. One bitter night, continued the soldier, you came upon a shivering sentry. His clothes were thin. He was nearly frozen. You took his musket and you said, go to my hut and get a blanket. Bring it to me while I keep guard. That soldier obeyed the instructions that you gave. And he, when he returned to his post, you took out your sword and cut the blanket in two. Kept half of it for yourself and gave the other half to this um, soldier that didn't have enough supplies. Here, General Lafayette 
is the other half of that blanket that I've kept all these years. Uh, for I am the soldier whose life you saved. Don't you love that story? The life of uh, men like Lafayette remind us of Jesus, of the loving sacrifice there. I mean, he was not in uh, France anymore in the court. He was in America, and he was going through a cold winter. He had a whole blanket. And Jesus said, if you've got two of something, give to one of those away to somebody that doesn't have it. Well, he gave, only had one blanket, but gave half of it away. So this man would not freeze to death during that brutal Valley Forge winter. It does make you think about Jesus, doesn't it? Who left heaven's comforts and came to earth and tabernacled among us. He didn't check in at the uh, biggest and nicest hotel there was of the age. He came into a manger and he identified with uh, the poorest among us even as in his death he identified with all of us rich and poor because for our sakes the rich man became poor. Jesus himself did that. But you know Jesus is also like the blanket in that story cut in two so we could be covered in the saving warmth of God's love when we put him on as our covering. I love how one of those hymns we just sang spoke about that, didn't it? You know, that trade that goes on. Our sin dealt with timelessly on the cross, Christ's righteousness as covering. And the way the sword of the Holy Spirit works is for everybody that gets saved, part of the blanket's cut off of God's love and now envelops us and keeps us in the warmth of God's love as we go forward forward. Well, folks, this is the third message now, if I'm counting right, the third message uh, through a series called the One Another's. There are so many rich one another's in the New Testament, and we're taking eight messages over these next 12 weeks or so, because we've got Easter next week and some other things, special speakers and things in there too. But we first learned what the key to our having fellowship is. We learned that to have fellowship with one another, we need to do what 1 John 1, 7 says. It says, if we walk in the light of God's word, if we walk in the light of the truth of God's word, if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so even though we have love in our hearts for every human on earth, when it comes to the body of Christ, there is a foundational commitment we're each to have to the God's word because as I walk in the truth and you walk in the truth, then we can encourage one another that we're doing it well or exhort and admonish one another when one of us is veering away from full confidence in God's word or something it calls us to do. Well, the second message was when we learned the Christian's goal. The Christian's goal is to love one another like Jesus loved us laying aside our time, our resources, and our rights to meet others' needs. We saw that from another 1 John passage, 1 John chapter 3, where it gives you the other John 3.16. Beloved, this is how we know love. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for each other. We also saw the amazing 1 John 3.23 that tells us that all of God's commands, this is God's command, can be summarized under the call to believe in Jesus and to love one another as he has loved us. So anything God asks you to do is for the cause of you believing right things and you loving others as you have been loved by our dear Savior Jesus. That's the negative commands, the things we're not supposed to do. We're going to see some of those today. And the positive things, the things we are supposed to do as we live out our faith in Jesus. So today we're going to add in four more wonderful one another's uh, in Colossians 3, which is such a great passage. And I'm actually going to take the time to read from verse 1 down to verse 17. Paul writes, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died. Say, I died. If you're a Christian, you've died. Part of you is dead. For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, verse 5, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, cleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, filthy language out of your mouth. 
Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. So Christ and our identity in him is far more important than any of those other identities that we used to think were so important. Verse 12, therefore, as the elect the chosen of God, holy and beloved. Put on tender mercy. Some of your translations read tender heart. Be tender hearted. Put on kindness, humility, meekness. Meekness isn't weakness, it's strength under control. Long suffering or patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Put off, put on, put in, and pour into. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this amazing passage. Lord, the book of Colossians as a whole is such a masterpiece. All of Scripture is. But we think about how in the first two chapters you tell us who we are in Christ. And then, and only then in chapter 3 do we start getting to the commands that because we are new creations in Christ and growing in Him and growing together in Him, we should together passionately pursue not the things that characterized our old sinful lives, but instead the things that would bring out the best in our faith and influence the world most for Christ. I thank you that all around me in this room are examples of that. Lord, you're the perfect example of that. Oh, how you love us. And even as we're at this time of year where we think about Palm Sunday and Passion Week and you dying for our sins on the cross, we're so thankful for the ways that you poured into us, Lord God, so that we could turn to you for eternal life and live out the abundant life you have for us together. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit will direct us now as we look into your word. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I just love the goldmine of information that's in those first four verses. It tells us that believers have been raised with Christ. It says, since you were raised with Christ. So if you're a believer, you have been raised with Christ. So where is Christ? He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's there in heaven. And the Bible says that if you've become a born-again believer, you have a reserved place with him there. Aren't you glad for reservations these days? I have a reservation tomorrow to get my vaccine shot, and I'm excited about it because uh, I uh, want to go on even in more freedom, you know, knowing that that's, uh, I've done everything I can to not get it myself and then not give it to others. So I'm excited about uh, that. But believers have a reserved place with uh, God in heaven. We still live here, but we're guaranteed a place there, right? So uh, I love how Paul talks about being ambassadors for Christ because if our citizenship is there and we are dual citizens of where we live, then we represent there here, right? And Jesus told us in his great uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount prayer, the Lord's Prayer, uh, he said, pray even that the, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a guaranteed reality later on, but we can make the world a better place too through our own faith and actions. I remember the summer after my freshman year at Bryan College. Um, I had been a Christian less than a year when I went to Bryan, and I grew like wildfire that year in my faith. Oh my goodness, it was all so new. Uh, my first time reading through the Bible, my first time, the second time reading through the Bible, but doing it with uh, professors that love the Lord, and students that were praying and uh, singing, and it was so neat. Um, But for the summer, I went back to Charlotte, North Carolina, the old stomping grounds, right? And uh, I was around the old ways, the old places, the old faces, both in my home and in that community were people that at one time we had run in a way that did not honor the Lord. 
I didn't get saved till I was a senior in high school. So there was so much, everywhere I looked, there were reminders of what I had been. And yet in my mind and in my heart, I was thinking, wait a second, uh, I'm a new man now. Uh, and I'm a Christian man now, and I'm a Brian man now. And so even though my physical body was in Charlotte, North Carolina that summer, a whole lot of my head and my heart were in Dayton, Tennessee at Brian College. And uh, I, I remember uh, thinking, okay, you know, uh, there's that saying, when in Rome do as the Romans do, Romans do, but what if the Romans are doing pagan things, right? No, back in Charlotte, I wanted to do what a Bryan College man would do. And so I did, and even had the opportunity that summer to lead others to Christ as his ambassador, uh, a Bryan man, a Christian man in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, Paul writes in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. That summer, I had set my mind on being who I now was in Christ uh, in, amongst the old company. And even though we live here, we're already setting our minds on the heavenly realities, the perfect love that's exhibited there, uh, the, the perfect uh, followership that is exhibited there with the Lord. I love verse 3. It says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I think there's probably at least 10 times in the New Testament we are told that if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian now, then you've experienced a death, a death. We picture it when we baptize folks. One of the reasons why it's important to have water that you go under is, is because the water represents a tomb buried with Christ in baptism. Just as Christ died, I want the old me dead. And just as you're trusting Christ to raise you up to new life, you're trusting that preacher to get you back up out of the water. And in the several hundred baptisms I've done, I've always gotten them back up out of the water. Thank the Lord, right? 100% track record there. Um, and we have 100% faith in Jesus that having placed our faith and trust in him, though there's a part of us that's dead, the person that wanted to do what Satan wants us to do in this world's values, Instead, now we're lifted up and we're now raised with Christ and we're thinking, we're setting our minds on the things that will always be true of us when we get to heaven. Verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Fabulous words indeed. Now, what does it mean to set your mind on things above? Well, the text tells us there's a putting off, there's a putting on. So in verses 5 through 11, we see that we're to put off the deeds of our old sinful natures. So Paul lists out for us that things need to put off the way you would put off an old, uh, dirty shirt. And he lists five things in verse 5, and it appears they're all under the heading of idolatry. So look at verse 5. He says, um, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, un uh, that's the word pornea there, so it's all uh, sexual satisfaction that would come from anywhere but your spouse either before marriage, after marriage, or any other way. Husband and wife, that's where all your uh, satisfaction sexually is to come from. Put off uncleanness, lustful passions, evil desires, and covetousness. And he says, which is idolatry. I think he's saying all five of those things are a form of idolatry. All those things are sins against the true worship of God, so they're idol worship. If you're claiming the name of Jesus but doing those things, your faith has gotten off into idolatry some. I love the line in the Michael Card song that says, we've made you in our image, so our faith's idolatry. And all around us are examples of people saying, well, we're Christians too, but we don't believe that from the Bible, or we understand it a different way, and the different way is the way that people that don't love Jesus have understood it for 6,000 years. So you see, that's idolatry when you do that. In verse 6, he says, God's wrath is rightly coming on the sons of disobedience because of those things. And in verse 7, he says, you yourselves... You yourselves once walked in those things. So we're called as a believer to put off our old sinful ways so we can experience the abundant life that Jesus promised to those who walk in his ways. And then in verse 8, he mentions six more sinful traits to put off. The anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, and lies. So 11 total things he mentions as things that we're to put off. Now, the Bible teaches that before you come to know Christ, you have an old sinful nature that will be with you still until you go to heaven. And so when you become a Christian, you get a new nature, and for the rest of this earthly life, the new nature is going to war against the old nature. Um, and so that's why it's so important that you read the Bible, 
that you pray, that you gather with other Christians doing the same, that you learn your spiritual gifts and use them to minister to others, and that you reorient your life around his great cause, his great gospel uh, being expanded to all the earth. It, it, it's your passion, no matter what else you're good at, you're excited to be with other believers advancing his cause on earth. And so you've been reoriented toward uh, this way of life, this thinking. There, and so you want to put off that which is inconsistent with that, and you want to put on what is now um, part of this life that God has for you as a believer, along with other believers. Now, you've got an old sinful nature, and you've got the new nature, and there's a war going on. And I always like to think of practical ways to illustrate this battle that's going on in everybody in this room with that old nature. And I think this is the best one that I know of. Now, some of you have uh, done a campfire. Uh, or you have done uh, a fire pit, and you have uh, had a nice fire there, and you had the warmth of it, and you have uh, been in a place where you say, okay, I'll just monitor the coals there, and sometimes when you go to your fire pit in the morning, what do you see? Uh, it's, it's contained in there, but inside there, you notice that if you stir up the coals, it's still going, isn't it? And even though hours have passed since you had the fire that everybody could recognize, the coals were still there. And if you put things on those coals now, what's going to happen? It's going to light up, right? The old sinful nature being with you always means those coals of the sin nature are always with you. If you feed them, the fire will grow. If you are a slave to a sin... Uh, whatever the sin is, and all the categories of sin that the Ten Commandments talk about, whether it's a, a lust or a lie or a greed or whatever, you know, uh, hatred, anger, uh, any of those things. If you keep feeding that, then you will have a part of your life that's out of control and will burn you constantly and hurt others too, right? So the old things, you got to starve. you got to say, even though I mess up and I have to ask God for forgiveness, I won't have as my life strategy to tolerate messing up. I'm going to fight, even if fighting means I finally have to get with another believer and confess my sin to them and say, we well, hold me accountable here because this is out of control in my life. I need it to be starved down so what God wants in my life can be built up. Folks, we're called to love God and one another. So undealt with sin messes up our fellowship with God and with one another, whereas doing what God says brings us closer to God and to one another. So these things we need to put off. Verses 9 and 10. Let's read those again. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. When I think of that, about that, I think about some of the great sculptures that are in the world. And I think of sculptors, the one that make the sculptures. They, they start with a big rectangle of marble, right? They order a big old slab of marble from the uh, art store or the art place. And when it finally arrives, they get it there. And then they do two things. They chisel out of the marble what should not be there. And then they're usually using a model, right? And as they chisel away what shouldn't be there, they're leaving what conforms to the model that they're using, right? Who's our model as Christians? Jesus, right? Jesus is our model. We want him to chisel out what shouldn't be there, and we want to be molded and shaped. We want to be chiseled to be like Jesus. The language Paul uses here is of putting off the old ways and putting on the ways of Christ. Um, you know, what's hard about this on a Sunday morning many times is we know that um, we can look good on the outside, and yet on the inside be full of things that are messing us up in life, sins, right? And so we, we can fake it. We can fake it. And we can look real good on the outside, but the reality <laughs> of what's going on in our lives can be just under the surface there, just under the surface. Instead of beauty, there can be lust and lies and anger evil thoughts and desires, whatever it says here on the back of the shirt, right? Um, all those kind of things he talks about. And we really do. We really do need to visualize ourselves putting those things off, those things which are not in our best interest. And every day, that's part of what you ought to do. Are there things in my life that shouldn't be part of my life? And I will be putting those off 
And I'm not even going to put this on a hanger because I don't want it to be around anymore, right? I want that to be gone. And instead, we want to put on the kind of things where we can empathize with one another and teach one another. And above all things, we're going to see in just a moment love. We saw it already. The power of forgiveness. Over here, patience, kindness, meekness, and those things. So, you know, uh, this is hard work in your prayer life. It's hard work in a discipleship group with others. But what we want to see is the putting off of the things that don't help us or others, and instead, the putting on of things that will help not only us grow, but also make us useful to others in the body of Christ and beyond. Oh, this is awkward. (laughs) Trying to get the buttons buttoned and the different things done there. Um, Now, since we talked about love for one another here, let's emphasize putting on forgiveness. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. I think everyone here would agree that forgiveness is an awesome concept. Forgiveness is wonderful, yeah. Everybody ought to be the kind of person that's practicing forgiveness. You know what? We think that until we have something to forgive. (laughs) Until something's hurt us. Someone's hurt us, right? And instead of forgiving, we want to hold on to that bitterness. We want to hold on to that grudge. And so forgiveness is often, uh, or the lack of forgiveness is often what holds uh, relationships back in families, in a church family, among Christians in a community. And uh, Satan just has a field day when we're not uh, fully forgiving one another. But Satan is wily, right? And he brings to our minds all the reasons we shouldn't forgive, all the reasons why we should hold on to stuff, build up that bitterness and that anger. But you know what one of the main problems is with an unforgiving spirit? The person hurt most by someone refusing to forgive is often the person who refuses to forgive. And so I've seen that so many times as a pastor over the years. Somebody is a good person, they're following the Lord, they're making a difference, but something comes along and they get upset and they get angry and they nurse that, they won't let that go, it eats them up on the inside and the whole body suffers because of one refusing to practice what the scripture talks an awful lot about forgiving each other. Someone has said, well, forgiveness is, unforgiveness, sorry, is a poison we drink hoping another will die. Think about that for a moment. Unforgiveness is a poison we drink hoping another will die. But if you drink poison, who's it hurting? Is it hurting somebody else? No, it's hurting you, right? And those that love you too after that. But God did not create humans. I mean, he, he, he's the ultimate designer And he did not create humans to hold on to toxic emotions like anger and bitterness. Like rust in an engine, unforgiveness messes up the human machine. What forgiveness is like is the lubricant that gets us back to full functioning. So, when you have something to forgive, go to God and say, God, I don't want to hold this inside. Before you, I want to freely forgive the other person. I want to release uh, my anger to you, my resentment to you, my growing bitterness to you. And then when the other person asks you to forgive them, do it. Having forgiven them before God, vertically, take the opportunity to forgive the person that asks for it uh, horizontally. You always do the one before God. You're always willing to do the other before men. And sometimes the reason they know it's an issue is because God puts it on your heart to actually have a conversation with them to tell them, do you know what you said and how it's hurt me? You know, or what you've done and how it hurt me. Now... I think that vertical, as we say, always needs to happen. If it involves something just horrific like abuse or something, you wouldn't want to necessarily go to that person before you've talked about that with a godly Christian friend, a counselor, a pastor, uh, etc. Because you need a strategy for that. And uh, sometimes if they haven't ever owned it, then, then you don't need to have that conversation yet. So there's real skill in soul care in going through those things. Um, When the Lord puts someone on your mind, you need to ask to forgive. Do that. Go to them and say, I've now realized what I did to you or said to you. Will you please forgive me? And give them the opportunity to forgive you. I think that's what Romans 12, 18 has in mind when it says, as much as possible, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. Be at peace with all men. Now, that does not mean there's not ongoing consequences to uh, be faced. Sometimes there are. Uh, You don't necessarily get the 
job back that you lost because you blew it, right? Uh, sometimes uh, you're already remarried and you don't divorce your current spouse to go back to be with the first spouse or whatever. There are ongoing consequences many times. Forgiveness does not mean every relationship picks back up where it was. Sometimes new boundaries have to be put in place going forward, such as the person that kills somebody and they're in a jail somewhere and you forgive them, uh, but there's not necessarily going to be ongoing relationship after that. There might be. Um, you know you have forgiven when you replace all that negativity you're feeling and thinking toward another with the words of Jesus toward another. So you're now blessing those who curse you. Yes, they hurt me, Lord, but I don't want them to go to hell. So, Lord, won't you bring them to salvation? You're praying for those who persecute you. Lord, maybe they don't even know how much they've hurt me. But, Lord, I'm praying for them, and I'm not going to be bitter. You're starting to pray the kind of things that are in 1 Corinthians 13, love chapter, toward them, rather than always thinking of them and gritting your teeth and holding that resentment and that sort of thing. And I'll tell you what, um, if you are in the room now or watching online and you, something comes to your mind, a person that you haven't forgiven that you're still bitter at, do yourself a favor and for the glory of God, forgive them before God and be, uh, begin praying those prayers of blessing the scripture has for people, the things like 1 Corinthians 13 over them in hopes that God will turn their attitude and life around. Um, you may be here and something has happened that you caused and so many years have passed you're like, well, I can't even go there. But let's say that your, uh, your actions caused the breakup of your marriage and your former spouse has moved on and uh, they have remarried. Uh, I think it would still be right for you to own what you did. Say, I'm sorry I did that. I know we can't have our relationship back but I want you to know I've realized it was sin before God. And uh, boy, if even just five people in this room dealing with something right now uh, were so convicted by the Holy Spirit that acted on the issue of forgiveness, it would just breathe new life into us and our church. And if you want to talk about that with me or another staff member this week, we'd love to talk with you about some of those things. So you put off and then you put on all the different things that were perfectly modeled by Jesus. Well, then in verses 16, 17, we see that you pour in the word of Christ and you pour into one another. So verses 16 and 17. So we're put off the old ways. We put on the ways of Christ. And we let the word of Christ, the Holy Bible, dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We let it dwell within us. We let it in. And then we pour it in, we put it into ourselves, then we pour it into others, what we're learning from God's word. Our first one another came from 1 John 1, 7, right? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Aren't you thankful for the beautiful words of the Holy Bible? Aren't you thankful that as 2 Timothy says, it tells us what to believe and not to believe? It tells us how not to behave and how to behave. It tells us about how we can be equipped for everything that God has for us in life. This book has everything we need to know and act on pertaining to our lives and our godliness. I love how Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He wasn't ashamed with what was in the book. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He knew it was the power of God and the salvation for all who believe. To be able to believe, you first have to be humbled and recognize your need. I'm a sinner who has things I need to put off. I, if I've become a Christian, I'm now a saint who has things to put on. And I want to keep growing in knowledge of the word by myself and with others. Um, turn back to Colossians 1.28. Colossians 1.28. Now we know what our... Leaders like Paul, the apostle, and what pastors and evangelists are supposed to do for us. It's Colossians 1.28. Paul writes, Him we preach, warning every man, that's the word admonishing there, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. So that's what I'm trying to do when I preach to you, right? And your Sunday school teachers are trying to do when they teach you. When we bring an evangelist, they're trying to tell you about Jesus, and they're trying to both teach you and admonish you so you'll get from where you are to where you need to be. If you're lost, they can tell you how to get saved. And if you're young and immature in the faith, they can help you keep on growing. They can equip you with things you need to know so you can be a great servant of Christ. But what's neat about that is, look again at Colossians 3, 16. 
This is written to all of us, and it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, same word as chapter 128, teaching and admonishing one another. So do you get what's happening there? What's happening there is it says, hey, we expect our preachers to be able to do that for each other, teach and admonish us. But here it says, everybody who's part of the one another's in the church is to do that for each other. And in fact, I say it in the 50-day devotional there, I've learned lots of great things from preachers over the years and evangelists and podcasts and all the different ways you can access teaching and stuff like that. But some of the best lessons I've ever learned were from godly lay people who just came up and said a word of encouragement to me uh, or taught me something I hadn't thought of yet. And, uh, and, and you have that ability. If you are a born-again believer in this church and you've been in Sunday school for more than five years, the frightening reality is you have more training than most third-world pastors do. And uh, you do know how to lead somebody to the Lord. You, you do know how to help somebody face an anger issue. You know far more than you think you know. Um, in fact, the word admonish is the same word as the one in 128 that spoke of warning. And the word there is nutheteo. So all Christians are called to teach and admonish their fellow believers, pouring into them encouragement and exhortation from the Bible. Romans 15, 14 actually uses the words. It says, you all are able to admonish one another. That word nutheo is the word, have you ever heard, anybody here ever heard of nuthetic counseling? Nuthetic counseling? The great Jay Adams, who was a great counselor, uh, he was the one that came up with the phrase nuthetic counseling. And by that, he was referring to this passage here, these verses here. That the average Christian can make much greater an impact on others as they share the word of God with others. The doctrine in the Reformation was called the priesthood of the believer, right? And we need to emphasize that early and often, that when we come together on Sunday morning, this is kind of like the huddle in a football game, right? They used to have huddles in football games. Um, uh, now they just go to the line and let her fly, right? But uh, they huddle up and then we go out. And all week long, where you are as a parent, where you are as a sibling, where you are as a teacher, where you are as a businessman or woman, where you are as a student, uh, you have the ability to help people know what they need to know to get saved and help what they need to know to grow. What an awesome responsibility we have in the life of each other. The picture is of a believer that loves Jesus coming alongside another believer who knows how much they love them and respectfully and gently sharing the truth of God's word with them, trusting God, the Holy Spirit, to do the rest. So I kind of take it that teaching is the basic instillment of knowledge, but the admonishing, the warning, is when you take the relationship you have with another and come alongside them and say, you know, based on what I saw you put on Facebook, <laughs> based on what I heard you say the other day at school to others, based on something that's happened in your life, I, can, can we just talk about that and, for, as, since we're both believers and look into God's word together and see uh, if we need to get back on track there? Um, you say, well, Danny, that would mean that, that they might uh, be angry at me. Yeah, it's not, they're not supposed to be angry at the preacher alone. <laughs> <laughs> Or the Sunday school teacher alone. Uh, they're supposed to know that we love them. And later on, even if they say to heck with you in the moment, later on, think hard about what we've said. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. And uh, no chastising, no discipline feels good at the moment. But it's the way that God works to bring us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Folks, I've done that many times. Somebody said something to me I didn't want to hear, and my initial reaction has been negative, only to not be able to let it go later on. And the Holy Spirit say, that brother was right, that sister was right. You uh, need to confess that as sin, receive God's forgiveness, and go forward in the ways that they were pointing out to you. We're all supposed to be able to do that for each other. Now, I love how when we think about this coming alongside and admonishing one another like this, uh, you know, master teachers, those that make a good science of it, usually have three or four things that are part of that. And I'm just going to mention a few briefly here. First of all, when you're talking to someone, and I've been horrible at this over the years, I'm trying to get better at it, but when you're talking to somebody, listen with both eyes, right? Um, because 
people, when you're making eye contact with them and not distracted and looking all the other ways and things like that, they know you care about them more. So listen with both eyes. And then many times uh, in listening and asking good questions, that's the next thing good people at, uh, go, uh, interacting with others do is they ask questions that allow the person to talk and bring to the table maybe some things that you need to shine the light of the word on, right? So you ask good questions. Um, God did it to Adam and Eve, right? They'd sinned. He came for the morning, the evening walk that they were rejecting, and he said, where are you? And uh, he knew where they were. He knew the answer to his own question. How you doing? No, no, really. How are you doing? You're listening with both eyes. You're asking questions. His heart start to melt. Head start to think. Good things happen. Um, Jesus asked such poignant questions. There's at least, sometime when you're going through the Gospels, look at the questions that Jesus asked. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Boy, that's one to meditate on, isn't it? He asks good questions. Also, telling stories that make connection are good ways to do biblical admonishment. Uh, you might remember uh, Nathan's story to David, right? David was in sin. He was compounding the sin. He wasn't listening. He was in the flesh. And Nathan came to him and said, hey, old buddy, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. A rich man who had a thousand sheep had a guest, and instead of using one of the surplus sheep he had to feed the man, he took his neighbor's one sheep. And David, as people in the flesh do, reacted in anger. Who is that man? If there's such a man in this kingdom, he must die. And then Nathan said, you are the man. You're the man. Stories, connection. That's in the context of the relationship that you've earned over the years to have the right to speak into truth, the other per speak the truth into other person. They asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Smugly. And he told them the story of the Good Samaritan where the last person they would have picked as, you know, the good terrorist. <laughs> That'd be the way we tell it, right? The last person they'd expect to be the hero is the hero of the story. And Jesus was saying, you have loving responsibility toward every other human being on earth is basically what he was saying. So, one final one here in the text. You notice I left it out, but look, it says that we are to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. <laughs> when I think of singing, I think that's between me and Jesus. You've heard the great saying, worship is before an audience of one. I love that saying. And in a sense, it's true. There ought to be a, 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 just a glorifying God and, and singing, oh, it's so neat to sing these songs to you, Lord. <laughs> but here he says part of our admonishing, our encouraging and exhorting one another is to sing the various songs of the faith to each other. And so I'll tell you what, folks. Uh, hopefully I'm doing okay here preaching. But a real draw for a church is joyful worship. Joyful worship. You got five alcohol, recovering alcoholics in the room and all take the time to show up and you're singing a song about how Jesus can get you from where you are to where you need to be and his grace is enough. You're singing those songs together and the one recovering alcoholic can look over and see the other recovering alcoholic and such encouragement and admonition can happen and just like, that's my story, it's your story. Don't you love Jesus like I do? He can get us to the other side of this together. Man, that's the body, y'all. That's the body. The ability to teach to one another. And even when we're singing, having the concept of how the others can feed off our joy. They can feed off the hope that we have in Jesus. And it can draw them. Hey, we saw it at the beginning of the service, right? Choir sings for the first time in months. Didn't that draw you? Didn't like, oh my goodness, I can charge hell with a water pistol because they just sang, we can overcome. And maybe I can overcome that lust problem I have. Maybe I can overcome that alcohol problem I have with the Lord's help and with my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. One another, one another, teaching and admonishing one another. Put off the sinful ways, put on the ways of Christ. Put in the Bible, pour into others what you're learning. Bow your heads, please. So for all my fellow believers that are listening right now, I just want to encourage you in your role in touching another with the good news of Jesus Christ. Not just those who haven't believed, but those who already believe, but Satan is throwing the kitchen sink at. And you get to come alongside 
and draw that person out and sometimes gently restore them to being back on track with Jesus. Fellow believers, will you just take a moment now and turn that into a prayer for yourself to own the ability God's given you to teach and admonish other believers. And as you do that, ask that God will bring across your path somebody this week specifically to encourage or exhort. And if you're here today and don't know the Lord, but you'd like to, this time of year we think about how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He met our need there on the cross. And we know that when he rose, he conquered Satan, sin, death, and hell for all who will believe. If you've never given to voice to your faith by as a sinner praying to receive Christ, I'm going to say a prayer now and let it be your voice speaking directly to the Lord. Asking God to forgive you. Pledging to turn your life over to Him and follow Him as the Lord from this day forward. Say a prayer in the quietness of your heart directly to the Lord. Something like this. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and you are right to judge my sins. I am tired of rebelling against you. I want to embrace you and your ways. I want to put off reliance on self and these sins and put on Jesus Christ by faith. Forgive me, Lord. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're in heaven now. I ask you to forgive me, to come into my heart and life, and I pledge to follow you the rest of my days. Show me what that looks like in these days ahead. In your name I pray, amen. Let's stand now. We have a song to sing. You can come to the altar to pray. You can put a praise pebble in the jar here. If you prayed to receive Christ, I'd love to talk with you about that now or sometime this week. You come as we sing. This is your time to respond to the Lord speaking. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power. and be seated, but let me have Dan and Hope Stickle come forward here. Dan, uh, Hope was already a member. Yes. You remember Hope Keeft? She's now a stickle. <laughs> and her husband, Dan, has taken the new members class. And if you haven't got to know Dan yet, you're going to love him. Uh, Dan uh, and Hope, uh, when did you get married? October 24th. October 24th. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, I'll tell you what, it was a, a great wedding service we had in the building here. And uh, Dan loves the Lord Jesus, and they're just such a cute and wonderful couple. Um, Dan, uh, for years now, has been in the ministry. Uh, he uh, worked with Chuck Swindoll and uh, now works with Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man. And uh, he helps make sure all the reaching out happens to fund the things so it can all... Yes. Uh, so there's uh, there's ministry there, there's fundraising there, and uh, you know, uh, so if you're here and you have a great like position that you'd like to talk to Dan about, he'd probably talk to you about that, Absolutely. since yeah. uh, he's living in Charlotte and she's up here and they're meeting on the weekends and stuff, but uh, God's going to provide the perfect place for them to be there together, and we just love them in the Lord. So uh, Dan, you uh, trusted have trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, Absolutely, I have. and you were uh, immersed as a believer. Yes, I was. And you, you uh, desire to use your gifts and talents to serve the Lord with other believers. Absolutely. Amen. Uh, now, I was going to present John Yates today also. In fact, I am. John has also taken the new members class. We have John's picture up there. There's John. That's John taking a selfie because he was at the hospital. John actually, we were going to present him last week. And um, John uh, just had a problem, uh, a health problem, and so he's been in the hospital. And so we want to go ahead and get this done for John, too. And John would have answered the same way to all those questions. So if you'll warmly receive them into fellowship, uh, Dan Stickle and John Yates, do so by saying hallelujah. 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 We're so glad that you're here. Let's stand together now. And... Uh, Let's see, I'll go ahead and close us in prayer, and I think, uh, you know, use your discretion about how you say hi to Dan and Hope there, uh, if you want to put all your masks on, or however you know, it's the, the uh, so many people have had the shots now, and other uh, reasons, we're just leaving that up to your discretion. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace, thank you so much for the truth of your word, thank you for bringing us together, Lord. I thank you for Dan and Hope, Lord, they've already been such an encouragement to me. They love you, and they serve you, God. And I pray that you would uh, meet all their needs, God. Lord, I pray and thank you for John Yates too, Lord. He loves you and is such an encouragement uh, already to those who have gotten to know him. Lord, he's had some health needs, Lord, in the last two years, and those continue on right now, God. We pray that you'd heal his body, Lord God. Thank you that he's one of us. Lord, as we have gathered to worship you and learn from one another, Lord, now we depart to serve you and use our gifts to bring others to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you.